Well, uh, as I said, I am not our senior pastor. You saw him in the video. Uh, he and his bride, Pastor Jessamy, are in Cuba. They'll be returning home soon. Um, Monday and Tuesday, as I recall, are actually the conference. And today he's getting to speak in somebody else's church in Cuba. That's kind of a big deal, y'all. I'm just saying. You can be part of a church that's part of that. That's awesome. Uh, my name is Rob Bellamy. I am the men's pastor. We just had an amazing men's breakfast. Can I have some men in the house represent? Oh, man. Really? Y'all ate $130 worth of bacon, and that's all we got? My gosh. Ah. <laughs> I'm also over our First Impressions team, so ushers, greeters, parking lot, and security. How many First Impressions team members we got in here? Yes. Thank you, First Impressions team. And then my precious bride is Sherry Bellamy. She's our women's ministry director. And Yeah, there you go. I know, right? I get to feel like that every day, don't I? She is definite. I am the head, and she is definitely the neck that steers the head. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'll, I'll let you into her world a little bit. So this morning, I, I watched Moana, or however you say it, the Disney movie, with my grandson yesterday. He's 20 months old, and uh, he was just transfixed to it. Like, he couldn't not watch it. And there's this scene in it. How many in here have seen Moana? Okay, that's a lot of hands. You, you'll probably get the reference. Uh, apparently, first service was so holy, they don't watch Moana. I don't know. But... Um, <laughs> In it, there's this, there's this scene where, like, they go down into the ocean. There's this giant crab with all this glitter on his back and stuff, and he sings this song, right? So I lean over to my wife first service before I'm getting ready to come up, and I go, baby, is my forehead shiny? <laughs> and she goes, you're so shiny. <laughs> and I was like, thank you, thank you. Uh, now you know why Pastor Cody is the worship leader, and I am not. But that's what it's like to be married to my bride. She keeps me laughing, which is a good thing. And like I said, we recently took over the marriage ministry as well. Uh, and we are grateful for that. I want to share a little bit about what Pastor Don has asked us to do in 2020. And I also want to encourage you that if this is your first time, please come back. You want to hear our senior pastor. Um, he's... He's the dad of this house, if that makes sense. And so it's good to hear from the dad. He carries an anointing and a vision for this place like no other. So please come back. If you haven't heard him before, if this is your first time, come back and hear from him. But he asked us going into 2020, he said, man, the Lord has done something very specific in my heart for 2020. He said, really what he's done is he's given me a vision for a decade, not for a year. And he said, so I want to make 2020 about being a first fruit offering year. If you go back in the, in the Bible and you look at this in the Old Testament, what a first fruit offering was, uh, if let's say that you raised cattle or sheep or whatever, or maybe you raised grain. If you raised animals, then whatever that first animal was that you had before any other had come for the year, you would take it and you would give it to the priest as an offering. If you had grain before all of the crop came in, when those first few shoots popped up out in the field, you would actually take that in and you would take it to the priest. And you would give it as an offering. And in that, you were really doing two things. The first is, is that you were saying, Lord, I trust you. I'm bringing you the first. I can't see the rest yet, but I'm trusting you that if I bring you this first, this first fruit offering, then you're going to bring in more than enough. I trust you with it. And then the other thing that you, were de that you were doing with that is you were also being thankful. You were saying, man, Father, I thank you that this is what you've brought me and I give it to you. I freely surrender it to you because I'm thankful for what you've done. And so that really paved the way for the rest of the harvest, if that makes sense. And so in 2020, he said, I want this to be a first fruit year so that the, the remainder of the decade, the next nine years, have a fruitful harvest. And so he's asked us to create some opportunities to bring in a first fruit offering in our worship. 
We've had, we're going we're gonna to have more worship nights. We just had one uh, Monday with Chandler Moore, and if you missed it, you missed it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to tell you. It's not going to happen. It's not happening next Monday, I'm just saying. Um, but we're going to have more of those throughout the year. And you'll want to be part of those things. Uh, there was a, well, I probably shouldn't say gender specific. There was an individual who's going to the doctor to get something checked out. But the, they believe that in that moment of worship, that God healed something in their back that they were going to have to have surgery on. They were able to go home and do something that they haven't been able to do for a while. And, and, and this individual was like, man, God touched my back. But I don't want to steal their thunder. We'll get to share about it. Uh, they're going back to the doctor just so that the, they can look at the doctor and go, <laughs> I told you. Um, just, those are the kind of things that we can expect because our worship team expects it. Our worship pastor expects it. Our senior pastor expects it. There was a first fruit offering of worship. And we're already seeing, seeing some harvest from it. And um, we're going to have more of those throughout the year. Like I said, the other thing that he asked us to do was to create more opportunities for corporate prayer. There's power in corporate prayer. When we gather together and stand in the gap to beat back darkness, something happens. It's powerful when you have an army of 500 versus an army of one. You know what I'm saying? There's just some strength in those increased numbers. Um, so, so what we're going to do is the first Saturday of every month, we're going to meet up here from 9 to 10 for corporate prayer. We just had our first one of those yesterday. And if you missed it, you can't catch that again in April, <laughs> first Saturday. And then the other thing that he said, he said, I really want to press in and fasting because fasting isn't about trying to manipulate our God. It's about making more room for our God. That's really what fasting is. It's like, I'm going to remove something so that I can have more of. I'm going to get something out of here so I can put something else in here from you, Lord. And so the first Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of every month, we're going to be fasting. Now, I don't know what that looks like for you. I would encourage you to participate in it and then in it be expecting and believing that God will drop something in in the place of whatever it is you fast. You know, if it's TV, social media, I, food, I don't know. For me, I'm just kind of the food guy. I, I fast food and that's what I do. But maybe pray, seek God about it, see what he would have you to fast and then expect and believe that he'll do something in and through that. And that's going to be some of the first fruits that we do. And Pastor Don said one of the things that he believes God's doing in and through that is that over the next nine years, the remainder of the decade, that we're going to begin to see revival break out in the region. Uh, that's a big deal. Uh, we hear that word a lot, but here's what revival means. Revival simply means that all of a sudden, everything is poised supernaturally in the spiritual realm, if you will, and there's an awakening to God and to the things of God. And it, it brings nations, countries, cities, states into this state of repentance, holiness to the Lord. And you see some radical things. And we've all been feeling that a little bit on the leadership team. And Pastor Don said, this is what you're feeling. This is what we're believing for. And I'm willing to make the hard call to say, here are the things that we're gonna do to see it happen. So connect with us in that if you can. And then he's been setting us up in our sermon series even for that. Uh, he just did a, a great message on bringing the Bible back because truth be told, um, we've kind of gotten away from the Bible as a, as a nation. Uh, you know, you start talking about the Bible and sometimes people look at you all goofy and man, it used to be that we were the buckle of the Bible belt. You know what I'm saying? And so he gave a great message on that, on why that's so valuable and important for us. And then he said, man, going into that, now I want to talk about the power and the presence of God. That's what we would call the anointing in our life. The power and presence of God is the anointing. And all of us have been given an anointing from God, whatever lane it is that we walk in as. Uh, if, you're, if you're a guy and you're married, then as a husband, there's an anointing on you from God. If you're a dad, there's an anointing on you for that. If you're a mom, there's an anointing on you as a mother that God's given you. And... And in that, we can do something to increase the power and the presence of God and that anointing on our lives. And Pastor Don explained last week that 
that where the value in this is, is that we're a royal priesthood. First Peter 2, 9 says that the second that we got saved, we became a royal priesthood. So it's not just, it's not just for Pastor Cody, for Pastor Don, for Pastor Dave, for Pastor Eric, or for myself. It's for every, we're all a royal priesthood. If you've said yes to the Lord and you've asked him to come into your heart and to be your savior, then you are now a priesthood. You're a royal priest. And priests should wear some garments. And if we look in the Old Testament back in Exodus, uh, Pastor Don explained last week that all of these garments that were put on, whether it be the robe with the bells around the bottom or the hat, it's really, it's a turban is what it says. Um, there are things that we wear and all of them point forward to how our lives should look as Christians. So the priests wore them in the Old Testament as a type, a shadow of what was to come after Jesus came and gave his life. And so today I get to dive into the, the first piece the first article of clothing that we're gonna talk about, which is the turban, the hat that goes on the head. When I do this, I, I wanna adjust something really quick. I know that the second that I said holy or holiness, something could have happened in here. Uh, depending on how you were raised or who you were raised around, that could have actually had a really negative connotation in your heart. And holy meant weird. It was just another word for weird. I mean, I remember one time when I was I, somewhere between six and eight, somewhere in that range, uh, we went to lunch on a Sunday and, in San Marcos, and as we're sitting there eating, this dude comes in in a, in a brown polyester suit. Boy, praise God those days are done. Um, and he stands up in the middle of the restaurant, like, this is a full restaurant, y'all. And he goes, let us pray. And like, eh, exactly. What you just did is what everybody in that restaurant did. They were like, what in the world? And it kind of rattled my cage. And I looked at my dad. I was like, what is that all about? And my dad goes, oh, son, he's just some holy roller. He thinks he's holier than thou. That was my first encounter with the word holy. It didn't have a, a real solid connotation in my heart. Maybe you've encountered something like that. And you're like, man, if it's about being weird, I don't want to be weird. And that's not what it's about. That dude was weird before he did that. You know what I'm saying? Okay. He's probably still weird. I'm just. <laughs> and so that's not what holiness is. So I ask you to put any of those thoughts aside, any of those preconceived notions that may be running through your head. And we're going to jump into the Bible. We're going to take a look in Exodus and in Isaiah and in a few other scriptures about what holiness really is in relation to our God, the holiness of God and then what that looks like for us as his sons and daughters. Can we do that? Yeah. All right, good. I'm glad you're confident that we can do that. So the first place that we're gonna start is with your takeaway. If Benadryl is kicking in and you're tired because tree pollen's really rattling your cage, I'm gonna give you your takeaway right now. It's gonna pop up on the screen. Holiness is actually your right, not your requirement. And we're gonna spend the next 25 minutes explaining that. Holiness is your right and not your requirement. So let's take a look at the holiness of God. Uh, Isaiah 6, one through five. Isaiah was a prophet and in chapter six of I, the book named after him, he hadn't quite become a prophet yet. This was his commissioning, his calling, if you will. He would become uh, what would be known as probably the most the most well-known prophet, the most prolific prophet, if you will. God used him to speak to the nation around him, all of the nations around him to say, hey man, we're missing the mark and there's a Messiah coming. And so Isaiah is full of scripture and text of prophecy of the coming Messiah and what he would do for the world. Now here's the cool thing. All of his prophecies were spot on and they happened about 400 years before Jesus came and walked on the earth. That's how you know there's something special about the Bible. Only God could put words in a man's heart 400 years before that individual even showed up to walk the planet. That's why you need your Bible. So Isaiah 6, 1 through 5. It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord, and he was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And attending him were mighty seraphim. That's just a type of angel. And they each had six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they flew. And they were calling out to each other, 
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies, and the whole earth is filled with his glory. And their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. And then I said, this is Isaiah, it's all over. I'm doomed. For I'm a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. But I've seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. Whenever you see in a text a word that is repeated three times, especially in the Old Testament and the Hebrew, they use that to, to really focus and, and show how powerful that word really is. It, they, they were like, God isn't just holy. He's holy, holy, holy. And if they said it three times, then that was then the receiver, the hearer of that knew that what you were saying was, this is the most of whatever this word is, this is the most concentrated of it that it could ever be. And our God is holy, 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 is what these angels are saying that surround his throne. And, and look at the picture. They've got six wings and with two of them, they're covering their eyes. They're going, he's so holy, I can't even look on him. He's holy. And Isaiah gets a front row seat to this and it messes with him. He goes, whoa, what do I do with this? I'm undone. I'm filthy. And the Hebrew word for holy is the word kadoshi. Kadoshi. And it means completely free from evil and absolutely pure in love and goodness. Completely free from evil and absolutely pure in love and goodness. And that's exactly what Isaiah encountered. He's in the presence of God and all he can do is go, you're so other than I am. It's like, I thought I was a pretty good dude. I mean, I'm trying to live for you. But even the words that I say about you can't capture who you are. They're just filthy. I know that's where I found myself almost 30 years ago this October when God spoke to me and called me to be his son when I was 19 years old. It's like I, I was in his presence. He called me and sitting on a loading dock, it's like all of a sudden I was transported to heaven, if you will. I didn't see this vision, but man, the four square feet around me on that loading dock became a holy place and all I could feel was Man, I'm just dirty compared to you. But yet his goodness, it was so pure that I didn't want to leave that place. And I believe that's what was going on in the prophet Isaiah's head when all that was happening. Now I want to take a look at that in the New Testament because we see something else happen about this holiness. And so we're going to take a look at 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16. So you must, this is a letter to a church, by the way. Peter was writing a letter to the New Testament church. The church was roughly 35 years old at this point. Um, and he says, so you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say you must be holy because I'm holy. Now this is, a, this is a different word, number one, because it's Greek, but the Greek word would be hagios. Don't try to spell it, you'll mess it up. Trust me, I did, it's wrong in my notes. <laughs> and what it means is that, that there's God and he's holy and God's over here. And, and he is just different, he's set apart, he's other than, and then there's everybody else over here. He's, he's other than. He's set apart. He's not like me. But then we see this charge. So be holy because your God is holy. And so you go, well, how do you do that? I mean, how can I be holy? And that is a great question. And it's really got a simple answer. And the answer is that what God asks us to do, 
He empowers us to do. Whatever God asks us to do, he empowers us to do. So as a husband, Ephesians 5, 25, tells me to love my wife like Christ loved the church. In and of myself, I can't do that. But in and through the power of God, I can love my wife like Christ loves the church. He wouldn't set us up for failure. So anything that God says, hey, do this, he will then equip and empower you to do it. And you have to hold on to that as we navigate this thing we call holiness. So here, let, let's jump back into our text, Isaiah 6, 6 to 8. This is the rest of the story, so to speak. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal that he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it, and he said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed, and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. Our text says that he went to the altar and he took a coal, a piece of coal out of there. So here's what the altar represents. The altar represents purification. So in the Old Testament, if there was, a, if there was sin, what you would do is you would take your offering and your, your atonement offering for whatever it was that you had done. The priest would then take that offering, put it on the altar, and the fire from the altar would consume the offering. And in that process, atonement was made for your sin. The price for your sin was paid. The rub is, is that people kept making, they kept fumbling, they kept tripping, so they had to keep taking offerings, and that was just a type. It was just a model pointing forward to the future. So the angel flies over to the place of purification, the altar. He grabs a hot coal from it, which in the Bible, when you see fire, it, it represents the Holy Spirit and purification. That's what it represents. So he takes this representation of the Holy Spirit that would come, and he goes over and he touches Isaiah on the lips and says, it's all good. Your sins are forgiven. You've been purified. It's safe for you to be in this place now. Now, let's take a look at that uh, in another passage of Scripture, 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light... As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So the second that you become a Christian, you were made holy, okay? God, through the sacrifice that Jesus made, the shedding of his blood, took your sin, my sin, and he removed it and he purified us. He removed all the evil. He made us holy. And then in that process, the Holy Spirit then comes to live inside of us, okay? The Holy Spirit then comes, resides in my heart as a believer, and that's where we get the power to now walk out a holy life. We see that in Galatians 5.16. It says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. In and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can choose to live a holy life. We can make some decisions about what we're going to do, and... I'm not talking about perfection. I want you to understand. I'm going to reiterate it again. We're not talking about salvation, okay? If you said yes to Jesus, you're saved. You were made holy in that moment. But our, our first text said uh, in 1 Peter that if you're not careful, then there's this tendency to go from, from this place. I'm now over here with God and I'm holy. And there's this tendency, if we're not vigilant about it, to then begin to go back this way. Some of the old desires begin to creep back in. We begin to step into some things that, that used to tie us down, but we don't have to go here. We can stay there and then through the power of the Holy Spirit. Y'all with me so far? Okay, good. And to understand holiness and this concept that I'm getting ready to dive into about guarding our minds with holiness, we have to view it through that lens of what holiness is. And since you said you're ready, here we go. Exodus 28, 36 and 37. Make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it as on a seal, holy to the Lord, and fasten a blue cord to it to attach it to the turban so it is to be on the front of the turban. So here's this turban that the priests would wear, which you're now a priest. And they had to take this and make this plate of pure gold and on it, it said, holy to the Lord. And then they had to take this blue cord and attach it to it. So it sat right here as a billboard to everybody out there, but as a reminder also to the priest that this holy to the Lord 
is sitting as a filter, as a guard over his mind. So what we see in that is, is that guarding our, our minds with holiness is very intentional. It's very intentional. Somebody had to sit and melt down gold to purify it and refine it. And then they had to make it into a plate. And then they had to engrave on it. And then they had to attach blue cord. And then they had to tie it to the turban. It was extremely intentional. And guarding our minds with holiness is an extremely intentional process. And in it, it sat right here, right over the eyes. So the first thing that, that they would think of when they were watching their eyes was holy to the Lord. We would say that the eyes are a gate. We can either let stuff in our eyes or we can keep stuff out through our eyes. It's about what I watch. It's about what you watch. And we have to guard it with vigilance, especially, man, especially today. Oh my goodness. You know, 20 years ago, it looked a little different. I mean, we now have commercials on TV that when I was 14, probably would have had an R rating. I mean, we just had friends and family over for the Super Bowl, and the halftime show came on, and about five minutes into it, which was four minutes and 59 seconds too long, I looked up and was like, man, I just gotta change this. I just, I don't even, I, I don't wanna watch this. I don't wanna let this in my home. I gotta guard my eyes. What am I letting in my eyes? It's, it's in TV shows. Now, I appreciate that I'm, I'm trying to navigate this carefully because if we're not careful, then we step over into legalism and we'll beat people up with what we think our holiness is. This isn't about everybody else. This is about me. This is about the decisions and choices that you make. I, I don't run over to my neighbor and tell him, man, I didn't watch the halftime show, did you? Oh, you heathen, you're going to hell. I, that's not what it's about. But really what I'm hoping is, is that by taking my life and going, I'm not going to let things like that in, that when I go over and talk to my neighbor, he senses something different. He's like, boy, there is something different about this guy. He didn't have to know I didn't watch the Super Bowl halftime show. That's for me. That's the standard I set in my life. So please keep that distinction because we can't, I don't want anybody to leave here thinking that this is about some legalistic pharisaical lifestyle. It's not about that. I'm trying to, my wife's laughing at me, that's rough. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to watch what comes in these things. The same phone that I can read my Bible on can get me into all sorts of trouble. The same social media that we use to help somebody encounter Christ can do the exact opposite. It can happen. I need to be mindful of what I'm putting in my eyes. I need to watch it. And I would encourage you to as well. We need to watch it. Hmm. Maybe it's, uh, yeah, I'll go there. Maybe it's video games. Uh, you know, I don't mind playing Call of Duty here and again, but there are some video games that won't be allowed in my house. I just don't need them in there. I don't want them coming into my soul. I don't want them coming into my eyes. I, I don't want that in there. It's, it's not doing anything but messing me up. It isn't helping me look more like God. And, and maybe it's not so much about the video game that's being played. Maybe it's about how much time is being spent. May, Maybe it's not about social media, but it's about how much time is spent with this thing in your face. Because there's a level, there's, a, there's an aspect of holiness that's about proper time management. If I'm trying to be set apart for the Lord and I want to look more like him, I got to hang out with him. And if I spend nine hours on Saturday killing zombies, I didn't provide any opportunity to spend in his presence so that I look more like him. I'll probably just look more like a zombie when I didn't get any sleep. You know what I'm saying? Just a thought, and again, I'm talking about my world, okay? You have to decide the standard for your world. I'm, I'm telling you what mine is, and I'm not holding you to that standard, okay? I, I need you to know that. And then the next thing would be, what about your ears? What am I listening to? What am I listening to? What podcast do I have playing? What music am I letting into my soul? What jokes am I listening to in the boardroom? 
What jokes am I listening to on the job site? What gossip is happening at that luncheon? What am I letting in here? Is it holy? Should I be participating in it? I'll tell you for me, uh, I've got about 150 songs on my iPod, and I was praying this year, going into this year, about some things. Uh, I'll just be real honest with you. In the, the last two years, there was a lot of people whose healing looked like stepping into heaven, and I was believing for something different. I was believing that healing was going to look like going home here getting up out of a hospital bed and going home. Not going home. And I'm grateful that they went to heaven. And, and I do believe, you know, that there is a time for that. I'm going to rejoice when I step into heaven. <laughs> I'm going to be doing a lot better than everybody else around me the day I step into heaven. But I didn't... I wanted some of them to go home. I don't know what else to say. And so as I was praying about that, I mean, I know people that are struggling with depression, and I'm praying for them. And I believe in God for them. And they're still hung up in it. And so I'm praying, I'm going, man, Daddy, I just, I just want more of your power, more of your presence. I mean, your word says in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, that Man, your apostles would walk down the street and people would wait just for their shadow to fall on them to receive healing. And, and you're the exact same God. You didn't change. So what is it? Ah, sorry, Dad, gum. I need a Benadryl. Um, <laughs> that's all that is. And the Lord spoke one word to me. He said, Holy. And it wasn't condemning. It wasn't like he was saying, son, you're not, you're not living a holy life. It's like he was saying, just, get, just remove everything. Just, just whatever it is. Maybe you need to turn your TV off. Son, what's your iPod playlist look like? Just make some more room for me. And you will see an increased power and an increased presence of me in your life. And I will tell you that one of the things that immediately came to my heart on my iPod with 150 songs on it, I had two that were from my BC days, my before Christ days. One of them was a 70s rock song. Uh, I was just a kiddo in the 70s, but there was a season in my life where I was in my teen years running around with a bunch of 30-year-olds. And so I inherited some of their songs. And then there was one from the 80s that I don't want to tell you who it was because then you'll be like, dude, I bet you had a mullet. I did. Uh, it's not a pretty picture. We've tried to burn them all. But that's what those two songs were. Were, were those two songs going to send me to hell? No. Not at all. Did those two songs make my God love me any less? No. Not at all. But if I can delete two songs off my playlist... And that'll be the difference maker between me walking up to somebody that's struggling with PTSD and just going, be healed. And then they can throw away their meds and never wrestle with it again. I'll delete them. It's just two songs. It's just two songs. Because I want more power and presence of God in my life. I want it. I want it, and I don't want it for me. I'll be real honest about it. I want it for everybody that I encounter. He's already given me everything I need. He saved me. He paid the price for my sin. I don't need another thing. But I want to make a difference out there. I want to see revival out there, and revival out there starts with revival in here. And I want to make a difference. I don't want to be short with my wife when we have an argument. When my kids see me, I want them to go, man, my dad, he looks like God. He doesn't think he is God. He looks like him. I want my grandson to look at me and go, 
So that's what it looks like to be in the presence of God. I want that. I want my neighbor that's an atheist to ask me, why, why are you different? Why do you mow my yard? Why do you, why do you come work on my motorcycle? Why? <laughs> and then he's impacted by the power and presence of my God. I want more of that. And then lastly, it would be the things that I think about. Am I guarding my mind? Am I guarding my thoughts? We're encouraged in Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, then you think about such things. What thoughts run unchecked through your mind? What thoughts run unchecked through my mind? I have to think about those things. Are they holy to the Lord? If my wife and I have one of those moments of intense Christian fellowship, am I thinking holy, admirable, pure, righteous thoughts? Or am I just waiting for her to finish talking so I can throw another jab? What's running in here? And then you ask, okay, well, then what's the standard? I mean, what, what do we do with that? Our text says that pure gold is the standard. It said pure gold, very specific word, pure. So I did some research on gold because I'm like, well, I, I don't think I know all I need to know about gold. 24 karat gold is pure gold. That means there is nothing else in it but gold. 18 karat gold is 75% gold, 25% other stuff. And 14 karat gold is 58% gold, 42% other stuff. And God said that if I choose it, if I decide, if I decide to live in and through the leading of the power of the Holy Spirit, that my thoughts can be 24 karat gold. I can set that as a standard in my life. <laughs> You can set it as a standard in your life. And again, I'm not talking about being legalistic, so be careful with that. Hmm. If this is a cliff, and I'm trying to live legalistic about it, then what I will find myself doing is this. How close can I get to the edge of the cliff? Can I create a rule, a law, that gets me right here because I want to look over the cliff? But if I choose to set a standard of holiness, then this is where I stand on the cliff. I don't even want to get close to that because I'm trying to increase the power and presence of God in my life. Can get over here. It's just one movie. It's just one joke. 18 karat gold. It's just one website. It's just one video game. 14 karat gold. Still saved. Still a son or daughter of God. Just less power and less presence. Ultimately, why is that important? Because it's about identity. On this plate, it said, holy to the Lord, and it was engraved upon it. So anybody ever play that game, Headbands, where you put the thing up there and you like begin to ask questions? You're like, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? You know, am I this? Am I that? Ultimately, I can choose, you can choose that your identity is holy to the Lord. And that's what everybody sees when they look at you. It's a choice. And why is that important? Because identity is about power and presence. As we talk about the power and presence of God and increasing that, increasing the anointing in our life, it's about power and presence. I'll show you this. This is awesome. You're going to love this. Exodus 28, 36. 
Uh, this is it in the Amplified. It says, and you shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engravings of a signet, holy to the Lord. In the Hebrew, it's, it actually says uh, a plate and engrave on it a signet. Let me help you with what a signet is. Uh, let's say you were a king, you were a powerful ruler or leader in ancient times. You would have a ring and it would have your seal on it, your signet. It was like a little pictogram or something that denoted that that's who you were. And you could send somebody, you could do two things. Like if you were sending a letter, they'd put wax on it and then they'd stamp it with that so that then when you were going on your, wherever you were going on your journey for the king, if somebody stopped you to mess with you, you'd just whip that out and show it to them. And they'd go, oh, my bad. I didn't understand. <laughs> you had the full power and authority of the king. I get it. Let me, let me just back away. It's like the king is here himself. Or you could give that signet to somebody and they'd just show it. It's like, Shh. and they'd go, my bad. Let me back up. I, I apologize. Let me get out of your way. In the prodigal son, Luke 15, there's an account where the son goes, he squanders his inheritance and he's living like a slave and he's slopping pigs, rolling around in the mud. And he's like, man, I just need to go home. My dad's powerful. He's wealthy. He's rich. I just need to go home and be one of his slaves. It's got to be better than rolling around over here in this pig pen. And so he, he, the whole way home, he's like, man, I'm just going to go in and beg that he'll let me be a slave in his house, a servant in his house. And when he gets home, the dad sees him and he starts to tell his little tale. And ah, Lord, you know, I'm just, I'm not worthy. And his dad grabs him and he says, Go get a robe, put it on my boy. In the word, we see what's called a robe of righteousness. It represents right standing. The dad said, man, you're in right standing with me. Get over here. And then the second thing that he gave him was a ring. He said, put a ring on his finger. He gave him back his identity. He put that ring on his finger and the son knew in that minute, I am a child of this man, he is my dad, and he has given me full authority, full power, full presence, because he gave me my identity the second he put the signet and seal on my hand. We see it again in Ephesians 1, 13, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal. Same word, signet. God took the Holy Spirit, put him in us as a signet, a seal that says, I am a son or daughter of the Most High God. And when hell looks at me, I have the full power, the full authority, and the full presence of God. And so do you. But you have a choice. 24 carat, 14 carat. How much of that do you want? That Greek word is sphragizo, and it basically means exactly what I just said. It signifies ownership, the full security carried by the backing, the full authority of the owner, sealing in the ancient world, served as a legal signature, which guaranteed the promised contents of what was sealed. So we land right back where we started. You see, holiness is your right. It is not your requirement. You can choose to be holy. I can choose to be holy and filter everything through holy to the Lord. And in that process, I have the right to be empowered to live that out and to go kick hell in the teeth. I mean, can I just be honest about it? I want some of that. I want some of that in my family. I want my great grandkids to stand on the foundation that I laid because I made a choice to be holy. Yeah. You can choose to do life apart from the power and presence of God and still go to heaven. But I don't know why you would. I won't settle for it. So don't be content, content to do life without the power and presence of God. So I would ask you, My guess would be that the Holy Spirit has probably spoken some things to you that maybe you need to adjust or filter in your life. I encourage you to write those things down. Maybe share them with somebody. Create an accountability process in your world 
so that you can begin to walk it out. And again, not from that legalistic place, but so that you can live in the full power and presence of the Most High God.